Walter Martin, who wrote the book Kingdom of the Cults, used to say that the church is the mother of the cults. What do you mean by that? Well, he meant that wherever the church refuses to teach biblical doctrine, it creates a vacuum. Therefore, a group will come in and teach it, and often teach it falsely. One of the doctrines churches are often reluctant to teach is the doctrine of eschatology. But eschatology is what gives us hope. Without hope, we can't cope. And if we don't teach eschatology from scripture, someone else will teach our people. So I want to encourage you to build at least four pillar passages into your teaching of the doctrine of eschatology. I'm Dr. Rick Durst, and I teach Christian theology at Golden Gate Baptist Seminary. And this little presentation is pillar passages on the doctrine of eschatology in scripture, and I want to use four pillars. Now, I've got more passages than four, but I want to look at Mark chapter 13, which is often called the little apocalypse or little revelation, Matthew 24 and 25, some of which reiterates what's in Mark 13, and famous passage in John chapter 14, which creates hope in terms of personal eschatology, what's going to happen to me when I die, and then cosmic eschatology, what's going to happen to the world at the end, Revelation 19 through 21, which sometimes causes eschatomania or eschatophobia. Eschatophobia means it's so terrifying, I don't want to read it. Eschatomania means it's so attractive, I can't stop reading it and thinking about it. And then there's Paul. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the relationship between the bodily resurrection of Christ and our own. And then 2 Corinthians 5, going back to personal uh, eschatology, what's going to happen to me when I die? And in the twinkling of an eye, I'm changed and I get a spiritual body and get to meet the Lord face to face. So these pillar passages. First, Mark chapter 13, uh, the disciples, Jesus, look at that great temple. Isn't it awesome? And then Jesus uses that as an opportunity to teach them that it won't last and that they should be alert, but not alarmed. In verse 10, one of the key passages that has motivated world evangelism uh, in the last 120 years. Based on Mark chapter 13, verse 10, in this understanding of eschatology, the gospel must first be preached to the nations, uh, to the ethnos. And in about 1900, John R. Mott launched the, um, the movement of the Christian student movement of evangelism around the world with this phrase. Let's bring Christ back. So looking at these passages, they said, okay, the gospel's first got to be preached to the nations, then we can bring Christ back. So where have they not heard the gospel? Do you see the power of eschatology, rightly or wrongly interpreted? Um, Mark chapter 13 says that we are to be alert for the signs, but not alarmed, and no one knows the time. So we should be alert by being ready for Christ's return at any moment. Um, Matthew chapter 24 picks up those same ideas and moves them forward and expands them uh, with some wonderful parables, the parable of the ten virgins, some who were prepared and some who were not, the parables of the last judgment, uh, where the sheep and the goat are brought and Christ serves to judge them according to how they responded to the least of these, his brothers. Uh, so again, uh, ideas related to final judgment for all persons through Christ. So we should be alert to that and live accordingly so that we're prepared to give an account in Christ. John chapter 14, Jesus is preparing the disciples to depart. He says, don't be afraid. Believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also, and I will come for you. So the anticipation of place with the Lord, the anticipation of his coming, and the reliability of his assured love. Then, Revelation 19 through 21. Almost everybody knows as we approach Easter, we think about Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a little donkey. But I suppose you can say, according to this passage in Revelation 19, Jesus has got two horses. Yes, he had that donkey, but he also has a great white charger. And as you read this, uh, it's a time of warfare, 
of spiritual warfare, and the triumphant Christ is going to ride forward as the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He also has the title in this passage, the Word of God. He's also the Lamb of God. The Lamb, the Word, King of Kings. And he rides forth to challenge uh, Satan and the minions, and there's judgment. Uh, Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. There's this strange word, the millennium, that I'll talk about in another uh, uh, video and the power of that word. And then the books will be opened at the end. Um, the books of deeds and also the Lamb's Book of Life. There's another video about the books being opened. I would encourage you to look at that. Uh, most people in every culture I've ever traveled to know about the Book of Deeds. And there's this sense of a scale. But very few know about the Lamb's Book of Life. They don't know the gospel and the great hope that that brings. Because it's not just one book, it's both books that will be opened. Um, and uh, then uh, the New Jerusalem comes down. You know, I think a lot of times we think about going to heaven, but according to this, the New Jerusalem, the Bride of Christ, is going to come down. So please, do yourself a favor. Do your, your people a favor by teaching, preaching, thinking through these issues in Revelation chapter 19 through 21. You can't imagine the way it energizes people to be patient during times of suffering when they have this kind of hope to cope with. 1 Corinthians 15, again, gives us the hope of the resurrection. I don't know if you know this, but based on this passage, um, everybody who's buried um, in the United States is buried with their feet facing east, anticipating Christ coming on the clouds so that they'll be ready for that resurrection. So that anticipation of a bodily resurrection, the continuity of identity, even though we have a spiritual body, the perishable puts on the imperishable. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5 sort of underscores that, that this uh, temporary tent will put on an eternal covering as we meet the Lord face to face. I hope you will study these pillar passages on eschatology. There are many more than this, but these are the ones they should build on. By the way, they all kind of look back to Daniel chapter 7. I hope you enjoyed this little video and that you'll watch some of the others also.